blah 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 and blah 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 the blah 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 and blah 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 the blah 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 the blah 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 and blah 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 the blah 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 and blah 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 the blah 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 the blah 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 and blah 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 the blah 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 and blah 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 the blah 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 the blah 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 and blah 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 the blah 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 and blah 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 the blah 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 and blah 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 Rather than being what I thought before was this giant ball of earth and lava and all the stuff that's in it, I felt it for the first time being a living, breathing organism. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Guy America Show. Uh, we're going to be chatting with Dr. Richard Lewis Miller a little bit later about psychedelic medicine and psychedelics. Also, we, we fucking get off the rails a little bit here and there. Funny enough, actually, Dr. Miller is coming back, and he'll be back again probably by well, the time he comes back for you guys. It's in a couple weeks for us, so probably in like five, six weeks for you guys. Uh, he'll be coming back to talk about, I think, like sex evolution and things like that. So that'll yeah, be that'll fun. Yeah, that'll be fun one. Yeah, got right up Grambo's alley. So without further ado, we got uh Graham Spermy over here. How's it going, buddy? I'm good. unprepared this How week for my uh That's okay. Yeah. That's all good. Graham Spermy is fine. Because yeah. we talk about that in the last GASA segment. Yeah. Gray America. Astro what is what does GASA stand for? <laughs> Whatever Besides we want. gear acquisition syndrome, it's just it's a play on NASA because we're sending a balloon America, to space with sperm. Aeronautical and space. So yeah, the last intro we, we joked around about that. It was pretty funny. Actually, you could send mushrooms up there. Now this is an appropriate thing. We were trying to get ideas from listeners because we have about thirty pounds to work with yes. to go in space with all the camera work and the other sensory equipment. Yeah. And you're, maybe mushrooms, mushroom spores. Mushrooms? Ooh. And then they just. Are they spores? Is they, that a pro proper uh, thing? Or are they seed? What, what is a. A spore? A spore. Is that a spore? It's yeah. a spore. Okay. Yeah. They get the spore. So, anyways, this is a great episode. Who did that one? I think that was from Sir High Noon. Sir High Noon. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Here, should I read his email? Sure. Oh, Since we're kind of now, I'm segment. fucking kind of feeling a little anxious about reading emails, so I'm going to peruse this. So now I know why Dvorak says this all the time. If you don't want your name mentioned, you really need to put it at the top. Because what happens is if I see an email that I, I'll scroll to see how long it is, and right away, if it's a certain length that's show-worthy, I immediately assume it's show-worthy if it's past like a paragraph, and then I don't read it. Because I don't like to go into reading these things that are pre-read. Yeah. So I'd read them for the first time on the show. So if you've yeah, got a whole a spiel and at you the probably, bottom. You probably want to just no, peruse no, don't, them no, once. No, I mean, I, no, I read them once. You do usually. it your way. I'll do it my right, way. Okay, fine. Okay? Yeah, fine. Don't, don't uh, meddle with my method. So anyway, if you're emailing me and you don't want your name said, you got to put that right at the well, top. Well, me too. I mean, I, that's an important thing for me as well. Yeah, because we just assume that everyone doesn't give a fuck. But we so. just went over it last episode where we forgot, or Darren didn't realize he tried to be all funny and jump into something and 
he didn't know what he was getting into. And yeah, was we a, just an, ran an, into anonymity. Now anonymity. I have to edit. I should know this word. Anonymity. <laughs> anonymity. Anonymity. Anonymous. It was anonymous issue. Anonymity issue. Anonymity issues. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we got from Sir High Noon, which I'm sure isn't his real name, which I'm sure is okay. Hey guys, this is my first time writing you, but not the first time you've heard from me. Spooky. First time, long time? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not the last either. Been listening for about a year now, thanks to a recommendation from my friend, Salvatore Antithesis. Ah, cool. Whom you already know. Allow me to say thank you. Your show is a much needed space of understanding, reason, and curiosity. If big media outlets were to invest in the kind of conversations and critical thinking your show presents, well, that's a world I'd like to see. I'll preface, or I'll, uh, I think I've read this already. I'll, yeah. I, I'd like to add, yeah, this was sent to you and forwarded to me, I think, strictly for the jingle. But I'm not, that's not really a world I'd like to see. I'd rather see a world where the fucking MSM is just gone and it's a bunch of independent media outlets talking about stuff like this as opposed to monopolies but anyway i digress that's the world i'd like to see i sent salvatore with a jingle for you guys when he was a guest on your black budget feed as a thank you for doing what you do and i'll keep lending my support whenever inspired to do so so on that note gas them motherfuckers I died listening to this segment. This insanity must be realized. Do it yourself. Rocketry is the future. I shall chip in more than this lovely PSA soon. Sincerely, Sir High Noon. Pronounced Sir High Noon, if there was any doubt. I am a music producer, beat wizard, remixer, audio alchemist in a portion of my spare time. Oh, cool. Sounds fantastic. That was a good one, yeah. We have that one, and then we have Crazy Billy's uh, Gas of Support Jingle. Thanks, Billy. Uh, so, yeah, that's Gas A great jingle. Yeah. I got to do the jingle up. It's rubbing your titty over there. Do you say titty nowadays? No, you wouldn't. I shouldn't. You shouldn't say that. No, no. that's trouble. Man boob. Graham at Grimerica dot com. All right. So, anyways, in, in you know stellar fashion about this episode, this awesome episode with Doctor Richard Lewis Miller. I think he had a good time talking about all this. We talk about the history of psychedelics and the healing aspects, and he really compiles a lot of this into this this fascinating book. <laughs> um. I've got a couple emails that are pertinent for this that I've been saving up for this intro. So let me tell. start with, uh, do you want to jingle this or no? Good. Uh, you just, what you just what sort jingles, of jingle right? would I play? Yeah, okay. Uh, let, let's just leave it for now. We can do it after. Yeah, Spam Graham's good. So this is, I don't know if people will remember, but I, I don't think we need to read the original email from Bob. This was Bob's email about... Uh, our episode with the tinfoil hat what guys. <laughs> no, we don't get into that. <laughs> I don't remember the Bob email. And it's mushrooms can't save the world. And he was kind of just Debbie Downer on mushrooms there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Fucking Bobby Downer. Bobby Downer. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. In episode 255, during the intro, and actually this is from... This is from a friend. Is this of the from show. Bobby Downer? No, this is from oh. Ascended Minds Network. So that's Ryan. It must be Ryan. Yeah. Is he supposed to be anonymous? I think too? Ryan's probably going to be invited to the trivia to the Ooh. Leopardy event. They're later. bringing him along, or we're going to take him. On. I don't know. Well, Maybe um, we should let him join Crews and Mistakes. You know what? No, no, no. I think about the two Ryans. The two Ryans. You guys had three people. No, no. Ryan and Ryan from a culture. Isn't his name Ryan too? You guys had three people. Is it two Ryan? Are they two Ryans? Come on. Yes, they're both Ryan. Then they Ryan should team from a up. culture. Ooh, that's a good Ryans. idea. The Ryan, Ryans. the two Ryans team up against Grand America in the next Leopard. Well, hopefully, the next Leopard we have to make sure they're up to it. Maybe they hate each other. Oh like no, crazy no, they're feud. both. They're, they both have awesome podcasts. They could have. A I'll link. I'll link to them both. They're both. Really Are they good both podcasts. in the chats? They're both in the chats. Yeah. One's Peverly, right? Yeah, that's right. 
Yeah, check out their shows. Yeah, I'll link to them both in the show notes. Great shows, both of them. So, good morning, gentlemen. In episode 255, during the so intro... this is from Ryan from Ascended Minds. Yeah. Okay. Graham read a letter from a listener co- coming over the from the Tinfoil Hat cast named Bob. In this letter, Bob, Bob, he said, mushrooms can't save the world and went on to lay out a few good a few points he felt that would support that claim. Now, anyone familiar with me or who has listened to the show, I hope would immediately, I hope would immediately realize I'm well, I, would, in real life. I would have a hard time not responding. So I wanted to take a moment and respond. I will try to keep things as succinct as possible. First and foremost, Bob, please don't take any of this as an attack or person or personally. I firmly believe everyone must follow their own path and what is right for some, most, any, may not be right for everyone. Now, before I get into this, his points, let's consider the Marsh Chapel experiment, a.k.a. the Good Friday experiment, which provides psychedel- which proves psychedelics can induce profound religious experiences. Further, a 25-year follow-up shows that all participants still claim the experience was a high point in their life. Second, consider the John Hopkins study in 2006, studying the increase in spirituality after psychedelic experiences. This study reveals that one year after the experience, the majority of the participants said the original experience continued to increase their sense of well-being and life satisfaction. That alone should be enough to support a claim that mushrooms might indeed be a path to saving the world. If you all don't want to read the rest of this email, I understand. If you're curious, his you points. All? You and, all? Does that mean like y'all? I don't think a, it works. It's the long as well form of you. you all. I don't think it yeah. works as well. I know. I know. Because he's from Texas, isn't he? I don't know. I can't remember. If you, all it up, baby. If you're curious, his points and answers below. Bob's point number one. Can you, can you do voices? Bob's point number one <laughs> the Aztec mushroom culture claim. No, no, you can't do that. That comes off as making fun of Bob. Does it? Yeah. Okay. Do that voice for Ryan. I don't mind making fun no, of No, I him. can't. There's too much there. I okay. Can't. Sure, the Aztecs may have consumed mushrooms, and they may have had some pretty gruesome traits. Correlation doesn't equal causation. Further psychedelics have been... Further, psychedelics have been around far, far longer than the Aztecs and most cultures have had some sort of altered states practice. Evidence of psychedelics has been found as early as 9,000 BC from Saharan aboriginals in North Africa. Consider ancient Egypt, thought by some to be much, much older. Eleusinian mystery schools, shamanic tribes, etc. So many cultures connected to mushrooms and other substances that don't include the, gr- include the gruesome things claimed of the Ab- Aztecs. Bob's point number two. Everything is worse since the 60s. This is pretty subjective and far-reaching. Would need more specifics, but even he says civil rights and women's rights. Seems those are pretty big things. Heart-centered, love things. Things that, well, change the world. Oh, he skipped Bob's point number three. He missed it altogether. Bob's point number four. People who use pot and acid are easier to hypnotize. Yes, some studies suggest that while under the influence, one is more open to suggestibility. This is only while dosed. Second, what does this actually mean? Scans show significant increase in brain activity and the amount of neural connections. So are we actually more open to reality? Are we more aware of interactions and connections in our dimension? Nice inflection. Are we more open to consider ideas? Bob's point number five. More, <laughs> now he gets Bob's point. More wars and bigger gaps between the rich and poor. I don't see the connection to shrooms. Seems like a political failing. And wars have sadly been a part of history since, well, history. Bob's point number six. People aren't as politically involved. I know plenty that are, but I personally have indeed become less politically inclined. This is because I've become to realize politics is politics is theater. Politics. You like politics? Politics. A trapping for the mind. I can now clearly see the games and power plays, and I feel I would rather focus my limited energy and time on what I feel have a greater impact. 
spreading love as much as I can. It's all about the love, baby. Bob's Choose point love. number seven, always chasing visionary experience and avoiding building a just society. This seems pretty subjective to me. I certainly haven't seen this, and with all due respect, this sounds to me like a projection. I can expand on that a little bit, personally. I mean, I do think there is a risk with shrooms and psychedelics that, uh, you know, that there is there is an addiction aspect to it. I mean, I know it can heal many things, including addictions, but I think there. I've met people that have been addicted to psychedelics. And, you know, even Graham Hancock's example, right? He quit smoking pot, but he went to... Ayahuasca, like what, eighty times or seventy well, times or sixty Graham times? No, 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 no. I'm just saying psychedelics on the show. Is that happening right now? A what? <laughs> being addicted to psychedelics? Well, on I don't know. How many times you got to go to the Amazon to do ayahuasca? Seventy, eighty times. Is that becoming an addiction after you get rid of your pot addiction? Like there is a, it could be like a, a you know, something to He's just be aware of. Well, there, so it didn't really work, did it? <laughs> 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 I think I think th- there has to be some reverence and you got to be careful and there is re- there is some risk. Sure. Right? Absolutely. You know, if I did mushrooms, I would want to do them next weekend, probably. Next weekend? And the weekend <laughs> after. Oh. Like that's how it would start for me. No, it's not how it works. For you, but I maybe got a bunch of mushrooms right there. I, I know you I know I I'm I'm proud of you for your control. I I would not be able to do that. It's not that kind. Of, oh, yeah. You know, weird. That's I know. Weird that's what I'm me. saying. Like, I, I you know. It's a little fiend. <laughs> fiend? That's not a good fucking description. <laughs> that's probably offensive. It seems weird to me that a person would want to do it week after week. Like, once or once in a while, in a long while, is good enough for me. If it was a bag of weed, it wouldn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. That's true. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's that's weird. I don't know. Maybe it's different. So what what was that about? A month off. Rogan took a month off of weed. Is yeah. That what happened? Did he? He, no, he didn't like remember. it. He didn't like it. I said his dreams were crazy. Yeah. yeah. yeah you should do it just for the dreams. Just do a dream journal. And then we can do a black do budget episode on your dreams. Yeah, I'm gonna take a week off. I think. Do, do a month. Do three weeks. No, do three weeks. Is the three weeks? The three week period of time is important for a lot of different things. Like your body recycles itself. It changes. You get through like the smoking thing, go three days, three weeks is very important. Three weeks for exercise, all that stuff. So go. Hey, my three three year anniversary of quitting smoking is in two weeks. Holy shit. That's unbelievable. So then do it for your, on your three year anniversary, go, go three weeks. I've been doing podcast. I've been podcasting longer as a non-smoker than I have. That is crazy. Yeah. So quit smoking, motherfuckers. Congratulations. If you smoke, quit smoking. Congratulations. You'll feel That's much good. better. Yeah. So Grim, Grimstake quit smoking. And you and you don't feel like a slave to it anymore, I think do you? failed quit smoking. To what, cigarettes? Yeah. Like, I mean, nah, you don't, sorry, in a while. sorry, you don't crave, you crave it anymore, do you? No. But that might be because I smoke weed. I'm sure that. Did oh. that increase your weed consumption? Yeah. <laughs> no, probably not. Anyways, we're not, we're not, uh, you know. Boo, boo, boo. Graham's little disclaimer. <laughs> Discl- that should be a jingle. Someone should fucking cut up Graham and make him a little disclaimer jingle because he's always disclaiming. Well, it's true. I mean, Graham, we don't want to oh, advocate drug use. I mean, if people want to do that, I mean, they do have sovereignty over their own consciousness. We believe in that, but Darren's making notes. This is rare. This is a rare occasion. No, oh, you can't find a I pen. I dropped my pen. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to continue on with this uh, email. Bob's point number eight, CIA put shrooms on us. Well, first, they've been around far longer than the CIA. Second, it's no surprise the CIA would try to control and weaponize something profound. Bob's point number nine, Leary and Wesson were CIA. So what? Who cares? Bob's point number 10, Maria Sabina claims that they were never spiritual, only healing. This actually is factually incorrect. Her understanding of healing is that it was inseparable from the spiritual. They were one and the same. Jesus and her Christianity was central to her mushroom ceremonies. Bob's point number 11, 
identity politics came from mushrooms. While identity politics did become more of a thing around the 60s, it wasn't connected to the substance. It was certainly used against those who used the substance, but you will find that it was designated, that it was designed by those in power, not the users. Important distinction. And of course, again, mushrooms have been far around far longer. Correlation doesn't equal causation. What did you just write down over there? Gramism. Yeah? Was it gramism or was it a jingle idea? Both? Uh, I didn't have a jingle idea. Right. So oh, fi- I, I already said the disclaimer idea. I'm not making the jingles anymore. Okay, final Bob, point 12. It, Maybe I should, actually. It degrades the regular user. I actually point- think the one on Mega that you made a long time ago is still on there. I should check. That I made? Yeah. I made a jingle? It's hilarious. I didn't make a jingle. Yeah. Did it? No. You made a disclaimer. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, my God. <laughs> a couple of them. Keep going. No, no, don't pull it up now. I'm not. No, no, Keep going. Don't pull it up now. I'm not pulling it up now. Final Bob point 12. It degrades the regular user. He points to Crowley and Garcia. So many points here. First, mushrooms weren't the only substance used. Second, everyone is on their own path. We can't know or judge what's going on for them. And most importantly, two negative examples were given. What about the tons of positive ones? Alan Watts, Eli Lilly, Terrence and Dennis McKenna, Alexander Shogun, Albert Hoffman, and on and on. Anyway, obviously, I'm passionate about this one. Love you all. Bob, still love you, sir. Maybe mushrooms aren't for you. You must make that decision for yourself, but I believe they can indeed change the world. Blessings. Yeah, that's a great email. I mean, I, I've, you, you know. You are so lucky I, understand. I deleted it. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it. You're still. like, the views of Grand American I've, don't express. I've got it still. Uh, do you? Yeah. Where? I never on mind. you? Never mind. Do you have it on no, you? I don't have it on me. I don't think. You gotta anyways, play it. Anyways. No, I'm not playing it now. Why? Because it's a different type of, of disclaimer. <laughs> it's a different type. That was a like a dr- drug advocate uh, disclaimer. Drug and alcohol or whatever. What was your disclaimer? It was about just listening to the show and like all the... Did you do it in a weird voice or anything? I don't know. I don't Did remember. You say it was it like five, four years ago. <laughs> I know. I, I think don't I said hear it, it I don't want to hear it. I think you like practiced and like stumbled. Okay. <laughs> These best are yours. <laughs> Instead of just speeding up the track, I think you're right. You tried to talk fast. Yeah, we were rookies back then. <laughs> Still are. For oh sure. yeah, absolutely. All righty. So thanks, uh, thanks, Ryan. I kind of agree. It's hard when the CIA is involved in this to to uh, honestly to to figure out where that stops and starts. But I'm my my, my I'm tending to believe now that. They, it's kind of like what you said. Of course, they were going to be involved at some point. You know, I don't think they started it. I don't think they co-opted. Like, it, yeah, it was probably monitoring it, and you know, some somehow getting involved. But I don't think it was, you know, from them. Sons of bitches. Yeah. Anyways, so that's that. I can't get it. Number 261, the Real Life Superheroes app. You guys should be the super spliff rollers so you can get people to chill out and just forget about crime. (laughs) On number 262, the Fandango. Colder than a witch's dick. I don't really get that one. Thanks, Rod. Uh, Ooh, this is a good one. On number 261, that was a real-life superheroes episode again. And this is by, uh, where is it here? Um, Skateboard Fun. No, sorry. RS Musical Instruments. Greetings and salutations, good sirs. Darren Graham Grimericans, we here at RS Musical Instruments need your help. 
We are doing what we know to grow our channel for the purpose of building three string slide lunchbox guitars for children in the Chicago public elementary school system. Way too much to type, so if and when you can, please watch a vid or two on our channel to pick up on what we are putting down. Chicago is known for a lot of good stuff and the worst. For me, and all that is known as being the murder capital of the world, this must and will change. We have got to get it back as the sweet home Chicago it was. Through charity, donation, support, same as your situation, the wife and I have been following you guys for a few years. We love the deal and topics you can Nastin's he he cover. We support y'all in many ways, sharing, discussing with friends, and the like to get into Gramerica. So thank you in advance. Love, Shane. Nice, thanks. So uh, he didn't send the videos. Did he send you an email? Should I just Google it? I guess that's RS. I could probably just go to RS Musical Instruments' channel. And then I'll we'll link to it in the show notes. Okay. We will, eh? You will. Isn't that how it works? Yep. You'll have to send it to me. Uh, I thought you were in an igloo. What's next? A round earth? <laughs> okay, I got another. Oh, are you done? You're not nope. done yet? The Star Wars, the cat Star Wars song was pretty sweet. This is from Baron, Baron Von Tucklecat. <laughs> that sucks that the fascist anti fascists are burning books in Canada. And we've got capitulate to the far left. What? Is she a five or something? Face bomb. Unfortunately, statements like this require thumbs down. And that's from Yulian R- R- Troyanov. Then we got from Ryan Eagleton. Did you just crawl out of a time capsule? There's a huge abundance of validity in the use of that phrase. And Baron Von Taco Cat. You seriously thumbed down Grimerica because they didn't capitulate to you? Are you five? I'm glad you face palmed yourself already. What does the five have to do with anything again? Five years old. Because he brought it up. Because we didn't care. Because she said, what? Because she used the phrase capitulate to the far left. Huh. By the way, unfortunately, you misspelled unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> On number 185, Wall Thornhill. Wall Thornhill is an engineer. Author is an aside, for fuck's sakes. I think that's a shot at you. Unfortunately. Who, is there, are the people really paying attention to what we say about somebody in the intro? I mean, all the stuff's in the show notes. Yeah, I guess so. Wow. What do we got here? Yeah, I think that's good. Do you have some other stuff to read? I was going to. Yeah, man, I got trip reports. I got trip reports to read. I got some more stuff. I had some stuff from the Twitter here from Bernie Warney, some of the UK posse. Great America. All right, lads. I saw some footprints in the frosted ground of a graveyard I walked the dog in. The footprints led to nowhere and disappeared. The next day, I took some random pics. What do you think? Could I be onto something? Tomorrow, I'm going with a steak. I'll kill that mofo. Nikki replied to maybe set up a trail cam. (laughs) In the graveyard? Before he kills people. And there's some pictures there if you want to take a look. Hmm. It's hard to see. I don't get it. It is hard to see in the pictures, yeah. Oh, yeah, I see, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Unfortunately, this episode is not going to come out before... He goes back to the graveyard. So hope. I like how they're not really like footsteps in the. I thought I was expecting like big footsteps and so they're just like light markings of footsteps. So a ghost definitely could have made yeah. that. Hopefully, he doesn't stake some morning jogger vampire. in the chest. I think he's looking for vampires. Yeah, I know, but hopefully, he doesn't get too gung ho. You know. Okay, this is an important email here. Important yeah. email. We don't have an important email jingle. I'll sure to email what I play. Well, it's it's a, play. it's a it's a trip report, Ooh. kind of. Or he says question mark. So I mean, right, American trip, trip report. report. Uh, let's see, Jimbo. 
Hey guys, name's Jim, and I've been a regular listener since the beginning of the year. I also heard about you. Heard of y'all. Beginning of the year? Like, when did you write a the email? Another y'all, huh? When did you write the email? Um, October 25th. Okay, so last year. I also heard about did, y'all. Did he write you all or y'all? Y apostrophe A-L-L. Like it's okay, supposed to yeah. be. Yeah. On the higher side chats. I'm writing you because of something that was mentioned on your show. The fact that Kratom may or not be something good for recovery. I really don't recommend it for such, yet at the same time, it was the only reason I do not drink alcohol today. Huh. Ever since I was 21, I had what would be considered a manageable alcoholism. Never got in the way, never was a lot, but yet I knew I would never quit. Over the years, it became almost tiring as well. All that said, it was definitely an addiction. At the time, I just seemed like the normal American thing to do. This, well, it is a progressive illness as well, they say. That's it. It does just get worse and worse, and eventually it's like, you know. Okay, so uh, this changed for me. One day, I was at the smoke shop, and I saw a bottle of Kratom and got curious. I was having some back problems and heard it was good for pain. I did some research and took a normal dose, which in hindsight was kind of a low dose for a 6'3", 220-pound guy. Something weird happened. Instead of pain relief, I felt hyper. I proceeded to pop open a beer and research why this was. Two things happened. Pop open a beer? Yep. Okay. Two things happened. I found out Kratom at low doses is a stimulant, and my beer just didn't taste good. I still finished my beer and a couple more, but didn't enjoy it. Over the next couple of weeks, I continued to use the Kratom because I enjoyed the extra energy. But every day, drank less and enjoyed drinking less until I just stopped. Kratom was kind of habitual at this point and kind of overtook my alcoholism. Yet, once I stopped drink, I started using less and eat less of the Kratom. And now, only use it occasionally for extra energy during a long work day. I use it more like a tool now. Looking back, I don't understand it, but from searching the internet, there are a few stories similar to mine. I don't think Kratom is good for trying to quit drugs and alcohol, but if someone organically picks it up and the wind is blowing in the right direction, someone might get some relief. Just for full disclosure, I've always smoked cannabis and Kratom did not make this habit change at all. Yet, I wasn't trying either. I don't claim to be... I don't claim this to be anything scientific, but I think it's cool and interesting, and I've read similar trip reports, so it's somewhat repeatable. Anyways, love the show. Keep it going. P.S. I'm from the U.S. and never knew about the War of 1812. It might have been mentioned in school, but never elaborated on. So weird how something just never gets talked about. Or like how we it, kicked or your ass. is it? So, yeah, I think Kratom's also, I've heard there's different types, right? There's different um, effects. So, yeah, there's a big difference between the red and the green. Oh, I Garrett will let us numbers. know. Garrett, I can't remember send the, us the a colors, Kratom but, rundown. But um, I've suggested it to my girlfriend for pain. and I'll I smoke some Kratom. But, uh, I think she tried it and didn't really seem to do anything. So, you, you have? Yeah, I didn't really remember. But, yeah, I remember Garrett got me to smoke a little. And you didn't remember? And Lisa got a migraine. No <laughs> way. Really? Yeah, but she gets migraines already, real bad migraines. So it's not like the kratom was, triggered one. Could, it had to be from that. Yeah. It could have triggered it. I mean, you never know. Yeah. yeah. And we will keep it going as long as you guys keep it going. Over to grandamerica.ca slash support and uh, supporting the show. You sign up for. You can do a one-time donation there. Or uh, you could be super great and sign up for a monthly. We got everything there. We got every price over there from a buck to 30 bucks a month. And of course, we can, uh, I think, actually, I seen that Ponzi pulled it off today. You can now, like, you can go to the one time donation page, I think, and type in your own custom amount, whatever you want, and make it a subscription. Cool. So you can do all that by yourself now. If you don't see a number you like there and the available ones, just make your own. So that would be super awesome you do that. If it wasn't for the, you know, less than 1% of the people that do support the show, the show wouldn't be around at all. Um, and, of course, there's a few more of you do support the show. It does give us the opportunity to try new things, grow new things, and who knows what else. Send things to space.
Yep. So check it out, grammarca.ca slash support if you can, when you can, and uh, check out the show notes for Graham's list of a uh, you know a bunch of other ways you can support the show that don't cost you a dime. That's right. Send in your emails for sure. Graham at grahamerica.com. G-R-A-H-A-M. Graham, Graham. Anything else? No, I think that's about it, buddy. No yeah, quote. This is a great episode. No quote? What do you mean? UFO quote? Oh, yeah, I got a UFO quote. Down and Graham going deep. It's a profound UFO quote of a week. You like this one? I will, because it's not just off the shitty CIA page. Yeah. We're not shilling for the CIA this week. Found your folk quote of the week. For America Buck Budget, ground is karaoke. In my view, and in that of millions like me, there is no question as to the existence in multiple of these advanced machines and in diverse forms. Discs, crosses, wedges, triangles, boomerangs, cigars, and their respective occupants in various manifestations. Grays, blues, humanoids, reptilians, and mothmen, etc. The question is not whether they exist, but rather, are some of them here to do our species harm or good? Who was that? Dan Aykroyd. Really? Yeah. I tried to get him on the show. (laughs) He won't respond. Try again. I will. You never know. You never know. I I was trying to get... um, Jim Carrey? (laughs) Yeah, he won't respond either. Maybe he will these days. He seems to be woke... The problem is he's is got like fucking meme? 10 million followers, so it's impossible to get through to yeah. him. But the people who don't have a lot of they followers and who I know handler. see my tweets is Bob and Doug. Bob and Doug. But they don't seem at all interested. I just saw something somebody saying. It was a review about us being a contemporary Bob and Doug. Yeah. I mention that when I tweet them every once in a while. <laughs> Forward that like, to them. I'm like, we get That's called Bob and Doug all the time. Forward that huh? to them. It'll be like, here's 185 star reviews, and this last one was about you two. Cool. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> yeah. Because it would be fun to have them on the show. A little Bob and Doug fucking revamp. Oh, yeah. That'd be awesome. So, but hey, that's not. Hoser, eh? Hoser, eh? You haven't even seen any Bob and Doug stuff. You got to do that, and then, and then you'll probably go, oh, I don't want to have these guys on. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, who knows? We'll see what happens. Maybe we can break through. What else you got? That's it. That's it? Yeah. That's all you got? You betcha. All right. Well, I guess that's it. We have a fantastic chat coming up with Dr. Richard Lewis Miller. And, uh, yeah, I'll play you guys out with some fucking good vibes here. Since this is like a Monday beginning of the week, yeah, we'll give you guys some good vibes to get through the week. If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. <laughs> 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 the Gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection, and put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Hundred eight breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection, and put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Hundred eight breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection, and put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. If Maury had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs>
right. So we're excited to, to have Dr. Richard Lewis Miller here with us. And he's been a clinical psychologist for a long time, decades. And he's the host of a radio show, Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. And he's the founder of nationally acclaimed Coke Enders Alcohol and Drug Program. And he's got a book out called Psychedelic Medicine, The Healing Powers of LSD, MDMA, Psilocybin, and Ayahuasca. That'll be a topic familiar to all our listeners. And, you know, he's been embracing the revival of this, this psychedelic research. And, I mean, we've talked to a couple of the, of the guys here in the field, like um, Dennis McKenna and Rick Doblin and these guys on the show. So we're happy to have you here. Thanks for coming on the show, uh, Dr. Richard. Uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. Calling me Richard is just fine. Don't need the title. Right on. Thanks a lot. Perfect. So, so yeah, we got the the book sent over from Inner Traditions. It's right up our alley here. Um, so, yeah, I guess maybe maybe give us a quick rundown of um, what got you, what sort of got you interested, and how you ended up uh, kind of coming up with the the book and. And yeah, how it's changed your outlook, especially after being in in uh, in the field for so many years. Um, have you always been interested in this, or did it just happen over the last little while? Well, actually, what happened was uh, I was uh, teaching at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and um, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert had uh, had a great deal of trouble <laughs> or let go from Harvard. Yeah. Uh, after doing experiments with uh, psilocybin, uh, giving that to prisoners, and they were successful experiments. Uh, but um, they made them an, an error. They did. They made an error, and uh, they um, they shared some of the psychedelic medicine with uh, with a graduate student. Uh, I'm not certain of all the details, and there are a lot of stories about it, but it seems that uh, the parents of the student... Uh, were influential and uh, got involved with Harvard and one thing left to another mm -hmm. and it was pressure on Harvard and so they were let go. And that was a shot across the bow that was a very important to me because I was uh, teaching in Michigan and I w was raised and trained to believe that if you put your nose down and did your publications and did good science, regardless of what the science was about, as yeah. long as you did good science, that you had a job and uh, you would not get fired for it. And it seemed as though they were getting fired for the nature of their research. We don't know the whole story about the graduate student. Um, and so that was a bit scary. However, at the same time, they came out with a book called the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And in the book, they talked about uh, the fact that uh, morning glory seeds, heavenly blue, they were called, and pearly gates, which were readily available at uh, any farm supply store at the time. Um, if you took enough of them, you would have the LSD psychedelic experience. So like a good uh, psychologist, I got together with a colleague and we ingested uh, 400, um, naturally we counted every single uh, kernel, <laughs> every single seed, if you will, and we took uh, 400 um, morning glory seeds. And I had a major uh, psychedelic experience and um, didn't really know what we were doing other than following the directions in the book, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is still available for those of you who wanna follow that. and. Um, and I had this major experience. And then um, not long after that, um, LSD was made illegal. And um, that bothered me. It bothered me that uh, a substance that uh, was in a seed, a morning glory seed, was suddenly made illegal. It, uh, it sort of disrupted my belief that, uh, that, that our constitution it was such that, I mean, the, the, the original Constitution of the United States, I don't mean the Constitution of an individual person, but the Constitution by which we live, I thought it meant that in the privacy of one's home, one could do to oneself what one wanted as long as you didn't infringe on another human being. And here, this substance that came out of the ground, the, these seeds were suddenly illegal. They were being confiscated around the country and so on. 
So that sort of set a tone of thinking in terms of you're asking where this came from. I was going to ask you about that specific time because I was wondering if, uh, you know, there, there wasn't there a lot of studies going on with LSD at the time, and that was a pretty big shift, wasn't it? The, the, I oh, think that's the, the shift you were actually just talking about was, uh, was critical. It, it was a huge shift. The English had been doing all kinds of studies, used treating alcoholism with LSD and looking for way to treat convulsions with LSD. And there was a lot of research on it. Yeah. The Czechoslovakians were doing it. Remember, Stan Groff came here from Czechoslovakia. We were doing experiments here in Maryland and the National Institute of Health. I mean, there was a lot of research going on. And of course, Huxley had brought us information about it, you know, the doors of perception, about, uh, you know, these psychedelic medicines and the potential. And there was a lot of excitement about, about um, revealing the inner workings of the mind, that we had a, a medicine that would, uh, would, would teach us what we didn't know in greater depths than we had any understanding of whatsoever. It was monumental, the potential. And then all of a sudden, gone. Yeah. And at, at the same time, we were also dealing with this hysteria started by Harry Anslinger in 1935, who was the first head of the Federal Narcotics Bureau, which was it was a political appointment by his his wife's uncle, Andrew Mellon, who was secretary of the Treasury. And and, and this guy Anslinger was a racist, an incredible racist. And and so he saw marijuana as something that black people used in order to have sex with white women. And he went on this rampage uh, to to prosecute people. Uh, it was a mess. And, and then he not only did that, but then he went to the United Nations and he had other countries in the world make marijuana illegal. And we did the same thing with LSD. The United States has covered the, the whole world with with sanctions, not allowing research. Once we didn't allow research, it was usually it was a major morality play and a racist play. That's really the basis of it. It was against the Chinese who used opium. It was against the blacks who were seen as using marijuana, supposedly to seduce white women. It was all part of a, of a terrible uh, a racist morality and ideology. And then LSD got caught up in it and thrown into the same pot and here I am, a psychologist teaching at Michigan, and I'm thinking they're, they're making illegal a key to the to consciousness, something that I, by eating these morning glory, glory seeds, got a taste of and realized there's something fantastic here, and now I can't, you know, can't happen. And then a friend showed up from Paris, Lionel Bloom, who I knew at college, and he brought me some real LSD. Uh, from Sandoz. Sandoz, we remember, was where yep. uh, it was originally uh, originally developed. And um, he gave me some. And again, I had this this incredibly wonderful experience, an experience that to this day is 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 right forefront in my consciousness. It was a recognition. A, 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 it was a, a visceral, emotional intellectual, what Heinlein called grokking. If you, if you remember Heinlein's book, Stranger in a Strange Land, if you, if you don't know the book, you want to take a look at it. But he, he had this expression, grokking, which was this more than thinking, more than feeling, mm. the sum total of everything was like a total knowing, and he called it grokking. Mm. And I had this sense of a total knowing that every human being on the planet is part of one big organism that we're all like pieces of one large body i visualized it like what i call a human hairnet like we're a hairnet all over the planet and i also had this very strong feeling at the time that the entire planet rather than being what i thought before was this giant ball of earth and lava and all the stuff that's in it i felt it for the first time being a living, breathing organism, and that what human beings are are just, are part of that organism. We are little cells on the on this on this large organism. 
animals are, the trees are, the, everything on it is all one living, breathing organism. And it was, a, it was a wonderful feeling. It was a tremendous feeling of connection, as you might be able to tell by my voice. I can still feel it right now. That's uh, 50 years later. And, and so I had these early experiences and nowhere to go with them, not wanting to get you know, disrupt my academic career by doing something illegal and certainly couldn't use any of these medicines with uh, patients as much as I might want to. And so it just sort of, I let it go for a while hmm. and let it go for maybe 10 years. And then something interesting happened. I was studying with this therapist who was a, an older tribal elder, also a clinical psychologist. And one day he gave me a medicine to try as part of our therapy experience. And he said, try this. This is called MDMA, methyl dimethyl mix. I'm tongue twisted. I won't do it again. MDMA. <laughs> Everybody uh, knows what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's, and, yeah, that was actually going to be one of my next questions. And I'm glad yeah. we're springboarding over to this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I guess I'm a little nervous. So I mixed up the word. So, um, he gave it to me at nine o'clock in the morning at his office. Oh my God. The effect started at about 9.45. We had a therapy session that lasted until noon. 12.30, I got in my car. <laughs> and at 1.30, I was back in my office. And I had a tremendously deep therapy session with him. And then I had a series. And then I stayed in therapy and I was having these, uh, not every time, but often I was having these MDMA therapy experiences. And then MDMA became illegal. <laughs> wow. It was saving and, too many marriages. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> but Single again, mothers are better for the state. <laughs> again, and I'm thinking, and then my political my political mind starts turning on and I'm thinking, what's going on here? Follow the money. Who's against these drugs? Why are they against these medicines? Why don't they see them as medicines? Why? Okay, I understand that marijuana became illegal because of this, this bigot who was going after black people and going after Chinese people with their opium. Uh, wh what's going on now with this MDMA? And then... In 1985, I was invited to a conference at the Esalen Institute. It was a, by, by invitation. And it was many people who were all interested in these psychedelic medicines. And Rick Doblin was there. He was, he was a, I think he was a, a, an undergraduate at the time. And they invited me because I had started a chemical dependence program called Coke Enders Alcohol and Drug Program, which you mentioned in your nice introduction, which I thank you for. And and they asked me whether whether I thought there might be promise in these psychedelic medicines uh, for people who are involved with drugs. And I was very uncertain. I was very uncertain because my take on, on, uh, on getting overly involved with, with drugs, uh, cocaine and alcohol, is that I didn't see that there was going to be an aha moment when all of a sudden it was all going to come clear and the person was simply going to stop. And part of it was that when people get involved with overuse of alcohol or, and cocaine, particularly heroin, um, uh, those are the, the three big ones. Um, a lifestyle develops. And the lifestyle includes all kinds of activities that the person has to do. There are, there are activities that a person has to do when they're going after an illegal drug. And the most honest people, if they have to go and do something in order to buy cocaine, you know, they're involving in, 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 in illegal activity day after day, or heroin having to go to bad neighborhoods. And then making excuses. I mean, nobody, very few people at the time, nobody's ever proud of doing heroin. Very few people are. And cocaine, well, there were times when people were proud of it and times when they're not. But what I'm saying here is that a whole lifestyle develops around being a person who uses too much alcohol or coke or heroin. Mm -hmm. And 
you don't just suddenly stop that lifestyle because you take some special medicine. It, it doesn't work that way. You, you have to learn all kinds of new behaviors. You've got to practice them and so on. So that was what I said. But again, I was very impressed by meeting so many of the people who were working hard to get licenses from the government in order to do proper research. Dave Nichols of Indiana University was at that meeting in 1985. I remember that well. He became and has been one of the foremost researchers in LSD in the United States. And Rick Doblin says to me, as is this cherubic young guy, I, I, says to me, I'm going to get a PhD and then I'm going to give MDMA to every member of Congress and we're going to change the world. I said, you who? Wow. I mean, go, all right, go, man. And, you know, he did. He went to the Harvard School. He got a PhD. He can tell you himself how far he got with regard to administering MDMA to Congress. I'm not going to speak for him. <laughs> but certainly I was inspired. And um, so that was a resurgence for me. That was a resurgence, reconnecting with these scientists. I'm giving you a very long-winded answer to my involvement with it. But the, and I hope you don't mind. No, it's good. So we prefer them. Okay, good. So that went on. And then, of course, MDMA became illegal. Then I watched a whole underground of therapists spring up who are using MDMA with couples particularly because it's such a hard opening drug and because it, it was so effective with people. And then I watched a sprinkling, a sprinkling of, um, of therapists start to use LSD in therapy, very sub rosa, because of course, not only would they lose their licenses, they might go to jail, who knows for how long. And then I'm watching as ayahuasca comes into uh, the, the work of Terence McKenna, and and uh, and Stephen Beyer, who wrote uh, Talking to the Plants, and Dennis McKenna, of course, the ethnobotanist, and I, I feel this I feel this um, renaissance going on, and so I decided that I would start with to bring you more you know close to the to the present. I mean, really, time is going by. Time is going by. People all over are attempting to get permits, attempting to get licenses. I mean, I I've interviewed. I've interviewed, for example, a 65-year-old psychiatrist who told me in her attempts to, to do MDMA research, the, the, uh, the FDA, uh, or no, it was the FDA, the DEA, excuse me, the DEA made her build a room made out of cement, if you can believe it. She told this at a conference, a major uh, conference. She tells a story how they made her build a room out of cement in order to put this one vial of MDMA into and then after she builds the room out of cement, they measure the back wall, which is up against the wall of the room. And they say the cement isn't thick enough because somebody could drill through from the office on the other side and get into the cement bunker. It was incredible. And she's telling this story, just matter of factly. And, and they made her make the cement wall thicker. This was all to take care of and protect one vial of MDMA that they were so freaked out about that who knows what would happen. So that was the period. But meanwhile, these people around the United States, these courageous people who I eventually interviewed, one after the other, were doing this research. These major, I mean, these, these people, they have so much, I have so much respect and admiration for them because they took such huge respect, uh, uh, risks with their careers, with the, Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins University doing research, I'm sure you know about the psilocybin research on depression. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 you know, you risk your career. I'm gonna tell you an interesting side story about this. One time when, when, when I was, uh, I, was t I think it was, I was teaching at Michigan and Ernest Hilgard, who was a famous uh, uh, psychologist from Stanford University came and gave a lecture. Hilgard had spent his whole career studying rats. And all of a sudden, he comes to Michigan and he gives this lecture on hypnosis. And in fact, if you want to research that, uh, he came out with a book called uh, The Hilgard Hypnotic Susceptibility Scale. Uh, it's a great little book. And so I went over to him after the lecture. And I said, Dr. Hilgard, you spent 30 years studying rats, and now you're telling us 
sharing with us this great research you're doing in hypnosis. How did you get from rats to, <laughs> I love saying that word rats, you know, that rats. <laughs> How did you get from, <laughs> from rats to hypnosis? And he said, well, Richard, it's pretty simple. If I would have started out in hypnosis, I would have ruined my career. Hypnosis is one of those topics like drugs. You try to do research on that, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. But study rats, I made it to full professor. Once I was full professor, then I went into the field that I wanted to study all along, hypnosis. That tells you something about what's going on in academia. Yeah. Academia is terribly influenced by morality and ideology. It's very sad. It's very unfortunate. It's something we've got to do something about. Scientists need to be allowed to do the science they want to do and not be influenced by morality and ideology and money. And that's why people go to academia, because they want to be in that what you call ivory tower where they can research what they want to research. Well, unfortunately, well, and it also seems like the research that's not being allowed is the is the potentially healthiest research to our culture and our health. I mean, it's everything from, you know, like you said, hypnosis to to uh, to drugs and, um, you know, even just extended consciousness, NDEs, uh, spirituality, like the list goes on, you know, that's really hard to get that stuff published. And yet that's what's going to benefit us, you know, to me, it seems like the most. The most. So then you got to follow the money. In addition to the morality, the people who are against any kind of expansion, who benefits by suppressing this research? Well, I can tell you, it's quite simple. If you're big pharma and you're producing a medicine called SSRI, yeah. selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? Which you have to take every single day of the year. So it's like an annuity for the pharmaceutical company. Yeah. You're taking pills 365 days a year. And along come these scientists from Johns Hopkins University and they give this psychedelic medicine, psilocybin, to these subjects. And one year later, they're still having a positive effect. You're talking about selling something one time to somebody versus selling 365. Imagine telling a car dealer, hey, on the one hand, we've got a car here that's going to last 365 days. On the other hand, we want you to buy a new car every day. Well, the pharmaceutical companies are dug in and they put a lot of control, a lot of financial control on Congress. I mean, I heard something today that was incredible. One of the Republican, one of a Republican senator said today when he was asked, why, why are you doing this, which is so obviously going to help the upper 1%, why are you doing it? And he said, it's pretty simple. He said, we're being pushed by the people who gave us the most money. The people who give us the most money are the people who are going to get the favors back. He actually said that. It's, you'll, you'll be able to find it because the reporter afterwards said, oh, my God, that's that's going to come to haunt that guy for a long time that he said that out loud. I don't know why he ever did. But that's what's going on. And and many of us know it, that the, the corporation money, once we had that bill that went through Citizens United, allowed the corporations to give unlimited amounts of money to political candidates, that for many of us was the death knoll of democracy because that allows money to buy politicians out in the open. And the combination of corporations being able to give unlimited amounts of money to political candidates, the combination of that and allowing lobbying, which in effect is legal bribery. That's really what lobbying is, isn't it? A guy comes into your office, he says, let me take you on a plane and out to dinner and give you this and give you that. And by the way, I need your help with this bill. In, in most countries of the world, it's illegal. Here, it's called lobbying. It gets a nice name, <laughs> but it's bribery. So we've got two things going at once. We allow bribery of politicians and we allow corporations to give uh, unless, limited, limitless amounts of money to politicians. And so then the pharmaceutical companies have a vested interest in selling their drugs and they push away things that, as you said, could be tremendously beneficial. You got the combination then of money, ideology and morality and religion going against research and it's been very difficult. So 
I yeah, started. I mean, excuse me. Go ahead. Not only that, I mean these corporations and pharmaceutical companies have basically hijacked all the universities and, and the legal they're the ones who are giving all the grant money. So all the research is coming back, whatever the pharmaceutical companies want it to be. And they've, they've infiltrated the CDC to an unprecedented extent and the not to mention the legal system. The legal system is, is the, and I mean, the other main one is the media. I mean, we've, we've done episodes where we've done a breakdown of, media sponsorship and 70% of all the major networks money, if 70% plus is coming directly from the pharmaceutical industry. So your, your program is a wake up call and I'm so glad you're doing it because those who are listening, I hope will do everything they can to stay awake and to learn the things that you're bringing to them on your program. And to take action, to take action as good citizens, as good citizens, find ways as good citizens to do something, not just sit back and not just talk about it. Let's get back to the book. So I interviewed these people from around the country who had the courage to fight their way through the system and get permits, licenses from the United States government in order to do research in LSD, MDMA, psilocybin, and ayahuasca. And the results that you'll find in the book are nothing short of breathtaking, phenomenal. I mean, <clears throat> when a person takes a look at what the brain looks like normally and what the brain looks like on LSD, it is so exciting to see the oxygenation of the dormant parts of the brain. This work was, work was done by the Countess Amelda Fielding, Amanda Fielding, I beg your pardon, Amanda, Amanda Fielding of the Beckley Foundation in London. It's, it's incredible research. By the way, the digital images of the brain, normal and on LSD, were published in the New York Times. So your listeners, if you wanna see, you can actually look it up on the New York Times and you will see the digital images. This is, this is groundbreaking groundbreaking research. So we have these people. And uh, I think this is bringing me sort of the conclusion of how I got involved, what the history of it was. And then I went out and interviewed all these folks and asked their permission to put them all together in one book. Nice. We bring you psychedelic medicine. Nice. It's been, uh, it's quite, it's been quite a journey. Um, uh, it, extremely exciting. Um, some of the work, I mean, I mentioned Roland Griffith's work, of course, the work, every one of them has done work that's of, that's of great importance. The work that Michael Midhoffer, Dr. Michael Midhoffer is doing uh, with PTSD, what's called PTSD. That's another thing, by the way, these titles that we put on people, PTSD, ADHD, schizophrenia, manic depressive, dimension these titles have to go it's just a way to label somebody to, to, to prescribe a different medication to them i think that's right that's exactly right and what we have found is that the number of diagnostic categories continues to expand which allows the pharmaceutical company more people to target with their medicines and we have found Famous professors, including those at Harvard, you can check this out, it's all there. Famous professors at Harvard who were involved with the, making these diagnostic, diagnostic categories on something called the, the, um, the diagnostic, the DSM. Yeah, Di DSM-5, I think now, or something like that. Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Diagnoses. They're on the take, the professors themselves, on the take of the pharmaceutical companies, and it has been proven. Unreal. Furthermore, the head of NIH at one time had a radio program. He was on 300 stations, and he talked about a particular medicine that was actually absolutely imperative, he said, for children with ADHD. And it turned out he was on the payroll of the company that was manufacturing the drug. So we've got a very challenging situation, and I hope we're all up for the challenge because we've got to deal with it. 
and we've got to deal with it in a big way. But meanwhile, what we have on our side are the medicines themselves and what they teach us and what they bring to us. And you'll see in the book, it's a great deal. It's a great deal. And the potential is enormous. We all know that. I mean, my gosh. For, you, did you all happen to see that uh, documentary that Sanjay Gupta did on marijuana with the kid with the convulsions in Colorado? Yeah, I did. Yep, absolutely. Now, wasn't that something? Oh, that- it's, it's unbelievable some of the results that, you know, and some days I think it's it's even past that. I think it's almost criminal that the criminal. fucking medicine and the therapeutic benefits from even something, even on the simple end, just cannabis that have been, <laughs> that have zero fucking negative side effects other than, you know, maybe the munchies and being a little lazy in some <laughs> shapes or forms or a little forgetful maybe. And, and it, it just, you know, what we're seeing nowadays with, with the legalization popping up all over the place, it, it really is disgusting. And it seems like, you know, somebody's got some explaining to do. Well, more than that, sir, we've got some changing to do, some very serious changing to do. You heard me laughing, by the way. I want to point, comment to you about why I was laughing, because I was laughing and enjoying your use of the vernacular, because you can do it. You can say anything you want. On my radio program, I'm, there are seven words that I'm not allowed to use, you know, oh, on the radio. Seven. Yeah, I think it's seven. It may be more, but I always I love the story that George Carlson always talked about. Uh, those of us who do radio, he said, "You can say any time you want that you pricked your finger, but you can't say that you fingered your prick." <laughs> <laughs> I remember he had that whole bit on the seven words. Yeah, that's a great. It was a great line, and that's true. I had uh, Joey Tranquina on my radio show, Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. Joey Tankina was a pioneer in needle exchange in giving clean needles because he figured out early on that it's way ahead of the curve to give heroin addicts, particularly street ones, clean needles because the disease that they're spreading with the dirty needles is much worse and the end result is so much worse and if you give them clean needles, at least they're not spreading disease to each other. And so it's called, you know, it, it's... Um, it's a much it's a much better uh, system. It's called harm reduction. And in the early days of harm reduction, Joey Tranquina took a lot of heat. I had him on my radio show and uh, he was talking about his experience and how much he was being hassled by the police. And uh, he said, you know, it's just it's just a lot of bullshit. And then he went on. I got a two page letter from my station, single spaced, uh, admonishing me for allowing uh, Joey Tranquina, this is something that stands out in my life, for allowing him to stop, you know, uh, to use that word. Uh, well, you so. know, it's funny because you were talking about more the word sort of getting out a little more, and I, I was going to mention that I think, I mean, between the work of MAPS and I think you're, you're seeing these podcasts, like especially Joe Rogan, who's reaching, you know, 30 million people a month all of a sudden, you know, he's been downloaded almost 2 billion times and he, and he's unequivocally pro psychedelic as, as, yeah, as just not only as a medical tool, but just as a spiritual tool. And, Joe Rogan, what's the name of his show? Uh, the Joe Rogan experience. Okay. Thanks. And he is quite literally, you know, like the biggest podcast in the world and it's to see that. And he's now, I mean, he's, he's, He's mere he or he's dwarfing all the mainstream media and and shows like ours. I mean, we're not we don't we do nothing compared to that. But I mean, there's there's a thousand shows like ours that are are doing these numbers. And when you add them all together, I mean, we've got the mainstream beat by such a a tremendous amount. I think that that it's only a matter of time. It, well, it depends if they can trick people into supporting net neutrality. We might get reeled in yet. How about tricking people into voting themselves more taxes? <laughs> That's what we're doing right now. They're yeah. tricking the they're tricking people into thinking that this is a middle class tax reduction when in fact it's not going to be. And uh, this has been going on for a long time. And programs like yours, and if you say there are a thousand like yours, it gives me hope. It gives me a lot of a lot of encouragement. 
purpose. That no, you can't be stopped. And, and nobody. And the thing is, we have listeners that donate to the show that keep us going. Like it's not it's not our regular job, but we we get enough support that our expenses are paid for, and and we can keep doing this, and that we don't have to worry about any any sponsorship or any telling us what we can or cannot say and and i think that that's resonating with people that we can just have honest conversations with people like yourself yeah i think it's the business model of the future in yeah. a lot of ways i think the ad thing is going to fall out of the bottom for that reason that you can't say seven words because it's going to piss off some advertiser i think people are sick of it there's somebody that i want to talk to uh, talk about in the psychedelic world that uh, are, are you familiar with the work of jim fadiman i don't know not okay. Not off the top so, of my so, head. So allow me to talk about Jim Fadiman. Jim Fadiman is a psychologist. I've known him for 40 years. He has a book out called uh, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. It's a must read. I think for we've everybody. heard that, yeah. Yeah. So it's a must read. I just wanted to get a mention in on it. It's a must read for anybody because one of the things about psychedelic medicine that is so important is to differentiate psychedelic medicine from psychedelic drugs. This is extremely important because sometimes the same exact substance can be used as either a drug or a medicine. But there are factors which differentiate and there are factors which create a different effect. For example, there are times when alcohol is the best anesthetic you can take. When are those times when you have nothing else and you've broken a bone on a ski slope and you're in tremendous pain? If you can get a couple of drinks down, it's gonna help the pain. At that point, you're not taking the alcohol socially to make yourself looser or to dance better or to flirt with somebody better. You're taking that alcohol because it has an anesthetic quality and it's taken away the pain in your bone. Let's use the example of MDMA. People use MDMA on the street. I don't know what it is that they're getting on the street. A mix of a mix of a bunch of shit in there. A mix of a bunch of stuff. Some of it's dangerous, and it's sometimes called Molly, as you know. Yeah. And it, and it's sometimes it's sometimes called ecstasy, and they use it socially. Well and good. I don't make any comment about that. I believe people have a right to do what they want as long as they don't hurt another human being. That same exact substance, MDMA, when used with a protocol that has been proven with regard to therapeutic benefits, is no longer than a drug. That same MDMA is then a medicine. But how do you know how to use it properly? Well, Jim Fadiman wrote the book on that, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, in which he explains protocol on how to use. And one of the most one of the most important features, and this connects to my book, Psychedelic Medicine, as well, that, w that one of the reasons these things are medicines is because they're used with proper procedures. And one of the procedures is having an appropriate guide. Yeah. Having an appropriate guide. If you're going to go up in a plane for the first time, you sure as heck better no pilot, have yeah. You want a good pilot who's teaching you. You don't just jump in an airplane and take off. And the first time you jump out, you're strapped to somebody else. Who knows what the <laughs> fuck they're doing. You're strapped. One of my patients said that. Yeah, I, she said, I, 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 I sent a patient to jump out of a plane for excitement in order to give her some a way to have excitement because she was a cocaine addict and was looking for the excitement. And I said, well, we got to come up with something else to give you excitement. Try jumping out of a plane. She came back to the group and she said, well, I had this experience. I went into a plane. I strapped a man on my back and jumped out. <laughs> <laughs> so and I did. I, I did want to dig into something else about about addiction and what you're talking right. about. So you talked about in the in the past how early on with MDMA, um, psilocybin, and LSD for treating addiction that people weren't coming back with, uh, let's say, a life changing experience. They might realize that you know maybe addiction's an issue or whatever, but they weren't you know changing everything right off the bat. But now with people using harder psychedelics, if there's I don't know how else to say it, but like stuff what? like, like um, DMT, like DMT, ayahuasca, ibogaine, um, the frog, the frog stuff. I mean, those people, I, I feel racist. like we're hearing they're coming back with those uh, instantaneous 
uh, and I don't want to say healing from addiction, but instantaneous help from addiction and, and, a, and a life-changing experience. Have you noticed a, sh- a shift between um, the earlier on stuff that you were talking about now later with the, um, the more extreme parts? Um, I believe you can have the big experience and you can have it in a very short period of time And you can use the big experience to cease the out-of-control behavior itself. But that does not immediately mean that you will change other behaviors in your life immediately. So if during the time that you were taking cocaine, for example, you became a liar, which is very common. Yep. New York Times, 1897. You can see it right on the front page. 1897. Cocaine turns honest men into liars because you so much, there's so much negativity around it and so much shame that people hide it. Yep. Well, if, if you develop the habit over a period of 10 or 15, like a patient of mine right now, I'm treating somebody 45 years old who started using drugs when he was 15. He's got a 30 year habit of using all kinds of drugs. He may take one of these things and see a golden light, I hope so, which is enough to cease the actual end result behavior, namely taking the Coke or mixing it with the alcohol or mixing it with speed or mixing whatever he is, you know, all these things. It may allow him to cease the end result. But the 30 years that he has built up of a lifestyle that goes with that, that's going to take a while to work on. That's going to take some guidance. That's going to take some help. And for I use the example of lying. If you're lying for 30 years, I don't know that there's anything that you're going to take in a very short period of time that's going to break that lying habit. You've got to raise your awareness up way high and come to grips with the fact that you are lying. And if what you've done is taught yourself how to lie so you think you're not lying, then you've got something out of your consciousness. And if during the psychedelic experience you were able to dig into that and get a glimmer of that, you're on a darn good road. But you got to continue working on that road because you've been building that stuff up for 30 years. It's a job. It's a job. No, I I, I totally understand that. I mean, I'm I'm a recovering addict myself, and I was, I always thought I was an honest, good guy, and then when I got clean and sober, I was was realizing how much I was lying to myself and to others, and, and it was a reflex that I had to, you know, consciously stop. Like, I'd be like, no, I don't need to fucking fib here or lie here. I can actually just tell the truth. And then it does get easier and it gets way better to the point where now I just, I, I can't lie or I don't want to lie. Like it, it's so weird that you're, you're, you're hitting it right on the head that it is a, it is an ongoing process. It has to happen. But I think there's hope there for people to, uh, to have that seed planted or have that real, like you say, the big experience that they can use to, to uh, move into that. I love your story. And, and, and yes, there is hope. The seed does get planted. But as you're pointing out, it takes ongoing work, it takes ongoing work. And I'll give you an experience from my own life, because part of how I went into the field of treating people who are overusing chemicals and drugs is because I was uh, out of control with my weight. So I weigh 205 pounds right now. I'm six, five and a half. So I'm real trim and I'm in very good shape. But there was a time when I weighed 295 pounds. So I was 50% more than I am now. Now that's going back a very, very long time. When I got into treatment, I got into therapy. I did a lot of good work. I lost all the weight and I've kept that weight off for many decades. However, it's still a day-to-day job. It's, it's still a day-to-day job. It's not something that I just like push out of my consciousness and I don't have to deal with and I don't have to, because there's still within me a tendency when I have certain feelings, yep. there's still that, ter- that urge to want to cover over those feelings by eating something. Yeah. <laughs> and that's often what people do. Not everybody, because there are a lot of reasons why people use too much alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, or whatever it is. There are many reasons. There isn't just one reason. 
But one of the many reasons is to cover up emotional feelings, pain, fear, hurt, guilt, wounds. shame, guilt, shame. Very good. Guilt and shame. Right. That's what and, kept, that's what kept me in. I mean, it really, it's you, you just hit it with the, with the cocaine and the guilt thing. That's what, uh, you know, I could never be honest about that use. Like, like well, some people could. Cocaine's a hell of a drug too. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's, you know, it just grabs you. <laughs> Come on. Yes, right. What was it? Who was it that uh, Robin Williams said cocaine is uh, God's way of telling you you've got too much money? Uh, <laughs> and and yeah, some of these some of these uh, substances are are seductive, and that's part of the job of of being a whole person, which is to learn about ourselves and and how we're using these things rather than having them use us. Yeah. And the same holds true for psychedelic medicine. Yeah. Yep. Same does, because I've seen people overuse some of the four uh, medicines that, that I uh, have described well by the scientists in my book, yep. LSD, psilocybin, um, MDMA, and, uh, and ayahuasca. I've certainly seen people overuse MDMA. LSD, it's, it's a, a, a less likely. It's only a certain amount you can do because it, it's such a big experience, unless you're part of the new wave that's happening now. Microdosing. Microdosing with LSD and with um, psilocybin. psilocybin. Yeah. Yeah. I've been humming and hawing about trying it with psilocybin for a while. There's a meetup group here in Calgary that are, that are meeting about it. Did you get the emails I sent you, Darren, on that? Yeah, yeah I didn't <laughs> I'll check into I have that. Gotten them. Send them along to me. I'd love yeah. to learn about what's going on up there. Yeah, there's a bunch of people doing it. Yeah, we're lucky enough to live in a in a part of the world that it's it's super easy to get, super easy and super cheap. In Calgary, in Alberta and British Columbia Alberta? in general, yeah, you uh -huh. can get them for like and literally and it's next pretty, to nothing. And it's not very strict here, really. Is that true with uh, with uh, uh, microdosing with LSD as well? LSD, I, I wouldn't know. I, I've been out of LSD is something that I haven't done in a, in a long, long time. Like probably, I think it's seven, seven eight, it's nine easy, years. But I, I'd imagine it's not too hard. The problem I would have these days is finding because I mean I was reading an article not long ago that said they were finding starting to find fentanyl in on LSD shit. So I mean that's yeah. part of the problem. It's kind of scary. Whereas you know you're always safe with some fucking mushrooms. You're safe with mushrooms, and if there is even the remote possibility of fentanyl being in it, you know as well as I, you can't go near it. That's one of the other problems with making these substances illegal, because it puts people's lives at risk for buying people things on the black market. And we know historically, going back thousands of years, that any time you make something that human beings want illegal, they're going to buy it on the black market. And very often what you're going to do when you make something illegal is you're going to create a criminal enterprise for providing it. Of course, that's the other thing that we've done in this country. We created the mafia, or if not created it, we, we expanded the mafia monumentally with prohibition of alcohol because they went in the alcohol business. And now we have created the criminal cartels of South America by making marijuana and cocaine illegal. Yeah. Major mistake, major mistake. People are dying left and right. In, you know, I think Mexico might have has become a narco country. Yeah, I, well, I think the guy got just got shot filming narcos down there. Oh, read about that. It wasn't the guy. What it was it was their it was their location manager who yeah, went down right. looking okay, locations, <laughs> no and they killed him because they don't want the American film company doing in Mexico what they did uh, down in Colombia on Escobar because they did that whole expose on how Escobar became part of the. Um, the Colombian government. Yeah, that a was a great show, actually. Terrific, wasn't yeah. it? Narcos. I think it was called Narcos, yeah. So I wanted to kind of ask you a bit about sort of along that same vein, not so much drug warish, but there's a there's a pretty big movement right now of people talking about, I don't know if movement's the right word, but you mentioned some of the guys in the past, like Leary and and uh, McKenna and, and some of these other guys. And there's a pretty big movement right now of people talking about this being a CIA operation and the whole psychedelic culture was uh, an intelligence operation. And, and um, you know, with you having been around for a while and been through the phases of this, what do you think about that? And it, can, it, can you, you know, discredit that? And is it, um, or is it something that was just monitored by them or kicked off by them and then backfired? Uh, do you have any thoughts about that whole thing? 
Yes, it's well documented. You can look it up on Google. You'll get an amazing amount of historical information. It was called Project MK Ultra. MK Ultra. It was a CIA project that went on for 20 years. It was an amazing piece of work. They actually, I mean, they did, these guys did research that was mind boggling. They gave LSD to people who didn't know they were getting LSD. They brought, they had women get men into hotel rooms thinking they were going to get sex. And they had a, a wall of mirrors where they had cameras behind them. And then the woman gave the guy LSD and then they photographed them and they videoed them. There was all kinds of nefarious activities because the CIA was thinking that LSD was going to be the greatest uh, truth serum known to man. And this project, check it out, MK Ultra. there's plenty of information on it now, uh, went on for close to 20 years. Yeah, we've, okay. we've, now, uh, we've talked about you, that. Go ahead. Finish that one point. For those of you who are listening, if you've tried ever 100, 200, 300, 400 micrograms of LSD, particularly when you get up into larger numbers, but even 100 mics, 100 micrograms, just try on for size, never having had a psychedelic experience in your entire life. You're sitting in a room, maybe with a woman who invited you there, maybe with a group of friends. There were all kinds of circumstances they did it in. And all of a sudden you're coming on to 100 or 200 or 300 or 500 or more micrograms of LSD. It's it's. It beggars the, the, the imagination to, to think of doing that to an American citizen un, without their knowing it. And what, what, the, what the, the aftermath must have been. I mean, you have to think you, you're going crazy. Oh, you'd have to. What have else to. Could, you, could you possibly? Of course. All of a sudden, you have to think you're going crazy. And that's what we did. Project Ultra. Glad you asked me about it. It's because... Because it tells you what we're capable of. Well, and it's extremely important for us to understand, witness, sit back and witness what we're capable of. Because it's only when we realize what we're capable of that we can take steps to ensure that we don't do that to each other. What about more of the covert sort of subtle cultural influence? Like I, we, we, you know, we, we've talked about MK Ultra a little bit here and, and there's some other programs as well. I mean, they were doing stuff in, in Canada in Montreal back then. Yes. I think the, you know, um, um, but what about more of the subtle, like the hippie movement, the music industry, the psychedelics through that or through the, through the, the, uh, you know, the magic bus shit or the tours? Like, what about that kind of covert stuff? Do you think there was influence there or, or was that more organic? I think that was more organic. Ken Kesey was a real guy. I'm, I, I knew him a little bit. Uh, he really lived in Palo Alto. The whole story of one flew over the cuckoo's nest is a real story. Uh, the bus was real. I've seen the bus. The people who were on it were very real people. Those acid trips really were going on in San Francisco. I was there at the time. Um, what were those? Were some of those experiences infiltrated by government agents? I would imagine so. Yeah, that's kind of the way I think of it as well. Surprised if they've got their nose into everything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. But in terms of what, what the, did the CIA create that? No, I don't believe that at all. I think it was totally organic. Uh, it was just too big a movement. The hate ashbury was very real. It was a very real, the, the whole 60s was a very real experience. It was, actually, it was one of the most fun and, ex, and, and, and exciting uh, times of my entire life. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a time when, when you went through a toll bridge in San Francisco, you very commonly paid the buck for the person behind you just for the fun of it. <laughs> wow. I mean, that, that's how it was. I mean, there was a real spirit more than any other time in, 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 my, in my lifetime. There was a real spirit of togetherness, of we're in this together, we're hanging together, we're having fun together, we're having a life together, we're going to help each other. 
I feel like some of that's coming back with the festival movement. I mean, there's festivals now all over the place and the whole, I mean, it's a little, it's a bit of a different scene, but there's still um, some psychedelic influence there and the raves and the people that are really, and it does feel like that well, even, same sort of love and peace. And, you know, I do feel like there's a huge revival here and yeah, over the last that, like, five years or so. In maybe. a digital sense as well, you're seeing the social, you're seeing the big social media networks kind of, I'm noticing break up into, and people are starting to spend more time on like, for instance, we've got our chat, grandamerica.ca slash chats. That's a perpetual chat. And there's a, you know, a few hundred people in there that are, that choose that over Facebook or Twitter. And I mean, we're not the only ones. I mean, I know of like five or six of them at least that are going, and I'd imagine that there's thousands and thousands of them too. And it's just, and I think people are finding that sort of sense of community that that's absent sort of, you know, people that can't go out and find it because maybe they don't get along or they're in a small town or for whatever reason can maybe find it in a chat room, at least to some extent. I on mean, my, we're noticing it firsthand in, uh, yeah, totally. in our chat room. On my, people. on my way here, I was thinking about the podcast and how great it was doing this. And the best part about it was meeting the guests like yourself and then, and then friends like James who's here and, and friends like really good friends that we're meeting in the, in, you know, online and in, in this, this community. And that's like the best part about this is. And other friendships forming that we're not even a part of. Yeah. And, and, you know, spider webbing and, and yeah. it's interesting to see how that works. Friends are medicine. I just did a show on the blue zones. The blue zones are the five places in the world where people live the longest. Ah. These these people live uh, 10 years longer than the rest of us. And in those 10 years, they live well. These are people who at 105 are chopping wood and running farms. Wow. 90, 97 year old surgeons doing surgery. And this guy, uh, Butner, uh, went around the world and visited these five uh, uh, zones and wrote a book of the blue zones. You can Google it and find. And one of the things, and so what he did was he looked at what are the people who live the longest, who have the most centenarians, by far the most centenarians. In our country, one in 4,000 people lives to 100. In the blue zones, one in 250 people live to 100, 16 times as many. And they have whole communities of people who are 102, 103 hanging out together. And so he said, what are the things that these five places have in common? And then he brings us that information. And one of the things is what you guys just said, friends. Friends uh, turn out to be a critical piece of medicine for all human beings. Fantastic piece of information, having friends and sticking with the friends throughout your lifetime. And he showed, he documented people who are friends for a hundred years sitting around and talking. Imagine that you're sitting around with your old buddy, you've been sitting around talking or a girlfriend for a hundred years. Amazing people. That's one of the things. By the way, the other thing they have in common is that they build exercise into their daily lifestyle instead of like going to a gym or going somewhere to do exercise, they build it in. And that's a whole thing that I've been working on in my life, the, be, doing the opposite of convenience. Convenience means you, you, purpose, you drive <laughs> around the block six times to look for a parking spot in front of the restaurant. Healthy means you purposely drive 10 blocks away so you have a little walk after dinner yeah. and you build, in, you build that into your life. Yeah. I'm really good at getting like three minutes of hard cardio a day. <laughs> 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 so i hope i answered your question on yeah, that one that was, that was great that's yeah. funny you mentioned that study i think one of the other ones was if i remember correctly was chewing your food like at least 20 times or something like that that's something well, that all these nations that people live longer have in common is they chew their food longer because the saliva helps is part of is a helps a digestive process and Blah, blah, blah. And you know what? And I still can't find myself to to it's hard. to find the I'm time. Trying, to, yeah, yeah, it's hard. It's like I'm so I've still got half a chunk of steak just fucking <laughs> scraping down. Well, of throat. course, because of what I said earlier, you've spent your whole lifetime chewing in a certain way. There's no medicine you're going to take that's suddenly going to get you chewing more slowly. <laughs> you've got to take control every minute, just as I do. I'm in the same boat as you are, by the way. Still always working on doing more chewing, but I've spent what 78 <laughs> years chewing the other way. <laughs> Yes, I got all right. So it's a process that we have to learn, but you know, it's worth it. It's worth it. We who get did we, 
Who did we interview that cured the stutters on a fucking insane amount of mushrooms? Oh, uh, really? Ah, uh, f- oh, that's good. A one, a one shot, one shot cure of stuttering. Uh, that's that's that should be written up. Somebody should document that and write it up. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh, you know who it was? We didn't interview him. We're trying to interview him. He was on the Joe Rogan podcast. It was Paul, Paul Stamets. And this guy's like uh, one of the leading mushroom doctors on, or mushroom <laughs> fucking scientists on the planet. And this mm-hmm. guy had a, had a stutter that he had been to, I think, five different speech therapists. And he couldn't cure it. And he, he randomly came across these, these mushrooms. He got some mushrooms from a friend. And he, he wasn't sure about dosing. So, And I'm totally paraphrasing here. People should check out the episode. Grandma will link to it in the show notes. Um, if they want to hear him tell it, but he's basically, he accidentally ate like, you know, 15 or 20 grams of, of fucking mushrooms and he climbed a giant tree and he ended up kind of stuck in this giant tree (laughs) for a thunderstorm. No way. And, uh, and the whole time he kind of, he, he said he grasped control of his stuttering and he sat there and I can't, I can't remember what the exact mantra was, but he's like, this stuttering is stupid. I'm going to stop doing it. And he repeated it. He said fucking hundreds of times for like two hours straight. And he said, ever since he woke up the next day and he's, he said, unless he gets, starts drinking or, or if he gets really excited, it'll come back. But other than that, he's, he's never stuttered again. That, that's a good story. Unbelievable. That's a really good story. One one time use. But he said it's that way. It said it's because the psilocybin opens up those neural pathways. And if you, you can slip into something accidentally, but if you can have a coach or self-aware enough to cognizantly go through a process, you can actually rewire your synapses or whatever. Well, whatever well, I was gonna add- so you could maybe get yourself to chew your food more. I don't know how you do that. Cause you well, we had, eat, we had the really. listeners to ta- ta- emailing us their, their experiences with the guy was uh, drinking Dr. Pepper all the time. And after he had those mushrooms at one time and he just realized like, what am I doing drinking this Dr. Pepper every day or whatever? And he stopped drinking it all together. Like there is those, those, Things and I was going to ask Richard about if he's if he talks about the um, that study I think it's from the UK about the brain on psilocybin and how everybody expected it to be more excited and and more active and yet it was quieter and there's less going on so it almost makes more room for like it it quiets all the distraction and makes more room for whatever new neural pathways or new perceptions or something. I want to come back to the, the stuttering guy because you said something that caught my interest, and that is that he, he, he made a comment to himself about the stuttering several hundred times. And the way I conceptualized that as you were telling the story was that he was working on taking the information about the stuttering and moving it from his, what you call his floppy disk from the, from the soft drive down into his hard drive and the hard drive you know is the is the hard wiring and so he was like making neural grooves if you will over and over again over and over again and and there's value in that there's a lot of value in that because it's it's sort of like when i try to learn a new word i'll say it over and over again because i'm attempting to send it down deeper into me so that it's 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 even more deeply recorded and i don't forget it and i i appreciate that story uh, i i think it would be interesting if there are any any psychologists listening to this or maybe we'll spread the word about it because it would be an interesting study to do to take a group of stutterers and have them try to mimic what it was that this man stein steinmetz did uh what's his first name it's paul Stam- paul paul stamets well, Stamets, I may try to find him on Google and see if we can put something together. That's a fascinating piece of piece of research yeah. he did. Go up yeah. in a tree and said it two hundred times. That's yeah, really- li- listen, listen to his episode on on JRE again. That's the show we talked about before. And uh, yeah, it's apparently it's a pretty mind blowing episode. I'll email you a link. If I don't email you a link in the next couple of days, just bug me. <laughs> okay, I will. Thank yeah. you. 
that's a, a GRE. Is that Joe Rogan show? J yeah, J yeah, JRE. JRE. Yeah, it's the Joe Rogan experience. The jo JRE, Joe Rogan experience. Okay. I'll follow up on that. That's It'd great. be on YouTube too, for sure. He has a YouTube channel. It'd be on there somewhere. It's somewhere uh -huh. in the last uh, 30 episodes or so, 40 episodes. Okay, great. Great. So where do we go next? Well, I guess it was just whether you had any thought about this, though, that psilocybin experiment from uh, the UK, I think it was, about the brain, if that was uh, something that was on your radar at all. You know, I'd have to see a similar piece of research that I referenced before that Amanda Fielding did with a digital imaging of the brain in order to comment on that. Yeah. Otherwise, we're talking theoretically, and we now have technology that can really give you an answer to that question. And you deserve an answer. It's a good question. But we need somebody to do that research for us, and somebody will. Yeah, that sounds good. So what else do you want to mention before we start wrapping it up? Is there anything else that you think we should cover about your book or about your research or what you're doing in the future? Um, well, first of all, I just hope that uh, your listeners will not only uh, purchase the book, uh, which they can get on Amazon or Barnes & Noble very reasonably, but that they it's will like spread... 20 bucks. Less than oh, 20 no. bucks. In the States, it's way less than 20 bucks, but it's like $20 <laughs> ads. Oh, yeah. I, I think Barnes & Noble may be selling it now for 10 or 11 uh, in the States. And um, so I'd like it, you know, spread the word, you know, tell, your email list, spread the word about it. So people, because I want people to be able to read it so that they can see what the real scientists are saying, not, not stories, not anecdotes, not stuff that your grandmother told you, all this kind of, you know, stuff on the street, but straight scoop from the guys who really had the courage to do the research. I'd love to share that information. Um, and psychedelic medicine, that's the book. Yeah, Where it's, it's very, uh, I wanted to mention, it's very, you know, it's like less than 250 pages. It's nice, it's spaced nicely. It's very unintimidating. It's a very unintimidating read. It's not like you see some of these books and they're like, you know, 500 pages and it's like, holy fuck. I'm but, not going to get but, through it. But this book, yeah, it's it's easy and it's broken up nicely because if a lot of people are like me, um, they do their reading in like 10 or 15 minute sessions. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really break broken up really well for that. So thank you. Yeah, thank Graham, you. I'll put a link in the show notes to where we where you can purchase the book. Oh, good. I thank you for that psychedelic medicine. Now, the answer to your question, where am I going next? I have a working title for my next work. It's called Sex Perts Speak. Uh, one of the other big taboo topics, at least in the United States, I think in your country as well, is sex. So I'm doing uh, interviews and I'm going to put a book together on sex. Nice. Every, everything you wanted to know uh, that's real about what's happening in sex in 2017 and 2018. This will be every form of sex, everything that human beings do with each other, boys, girls, men, women, the same sex, different sex, uh, and what the, uh, you know, what, what just what it's all about and what the physiology is all about. I'll just give you one quick, I, I've started the interviews already. And uh, one of the things I've discovered in my research, which the experts bear out, is that, um, all of my life, I thought the uh, the female clitoris was um, a little a small piece of, uh, of of flesh that was right at the uh, top of the vagina, and it turns out I was mistaken. It's very long. It's very long, and it's it's not even straight. It's shaped like a wishbone. It goes down, and then it goes around on both sides, and then it goes d in, and then it goes inside. And so th that was a fun thing. I wish I would have known it all my life because I could have given, you know, women. It's good that, to know it now. We have our audience's averages around 30. So this is really valuable advice. Well, it is great because it now means that you can give your female partner a great deal more pleasure than you ever could before because you can follow the road of the clitoris. And so, some of dark. these guys are going to be having sex soon. Well, I hope so. I mean, because, that, <laughs> because that's, that's another reason I'm doing the book. Because, I mean, sex has gotten such a bad rap for the last 2,000 years. And before that, it didn't have a bad rap, by the way. Before that, it had a pretty good rap. But for the last 2,000 years, it's gotten a really bad rap. And, and it's so hypocritical. And as a psychologist, 
hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is detrimental to human health. And so when so many people are doing something that we all, almost everybody likes to do, and it's part of procreation in addition, and then we make it into something bad or something sick or something dirty or something you can't talk about, it, it messes with people's heads. And yep. it does in a very bad way because this, when you have a basic drive such as sexuality, I mean, in a way, the, the crime that we did with sex is worse than the crime by making psychedelic medicine illegal because, because sex is something we all have in us. And almost everybody has a sex drive. Not everybody. I said almost everybody. Almost everybody has a sex drive. So here you take something. It would be almost like water. Everybody needs to drink water. But suppose we made water drinking morally bad. And if you drink water, you should be ashamed. Well, you should drink, do it in secret. Well, you should never tell anybody when you do it. You're going to hell. You got to hide when you have a sip of water. Well, in a way, that's what we've done. And we, it, it, is, it is bizarre what's going on in this country. It's really bizarre. And then, of course, what's happening now is all the exposés of all these guys who are doing all this stuff, you know, coming on to women that don't want them to be coming on to them. And that's, that's part of what comes out of this sick mentality is, is, is predatory behavior. Yeah. Because if, every, if everything was out in the open, exactly. nobody, nobody would be able to get away with this kind of stuff. Some guy would do that kind of thing. The woman would walk in the other room and say, hey, hey, this guy Harvey just tried to grab my, my ass. What's going Piece on here? Shit. Yeah. Yeah, that's very schizophrenic. Well, this sounds like another interview. I yeah, mean, we for should, sure. We, we should, should have uh, him back on We for should sure. go on, and uh, why don't okay. we do... I mean, I think we're booking late January, early February, but I'll email you. Maybe we can do that uh, that one next, and we'll just do sex. Not Love like, to, not like it. there's got to be a better way to say that, but... <laughs> <laughs> very cute. Thank you. You guys are great. You're really great. You're putting a big smile on my face. Right on. Yeah, we'll look forward to chatting with you again. Okay. Thank okay. you so much for having Thank me. It's really been fun. It's been terrific fun. This is a whole different kind of thing than radio, and it's very enjoyable. I thank you for the experience. Right on. Thanks a yeah, lot, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do it again real soon. Okay. Would okay. you send me a copy of this interview? Can you do that? You bet. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. And then yeah. I'll send it to Ashley at End of Traditions. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds okay. good. Oh, I should say that. That would be nice for me to say that uh, Psychedelic Medicines is published by Inner Traditions, Bear and Company. They're up in Vermont. Great group of people. Awesome. Oh, group yeah. Of people, Shout yeah. out to me. Uh, yeah. 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 I'll John, put a link John's in the show notes friend. for that. Yeah. Too. Put yeah. a link in for it. Give him a plug. Thanks. Right on. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, bye-bye. That was a chat with Dr. Richard. Lewis Miller? That's yep. right, right? You know, I get confused because we just had on, who is it, Dr. Richard Allen Miller. I know. I've and we're about to have on Dr. Richard, Richard Katz. Yeah, and it's just, yeah. There's a lot of Richards. A lot of dicks. <laughs> Grand fantasy. Uh, <laughs> not going to go there. Um, geez. Sorry. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> just degenerates within 30 seconds of hanging up the phone. <laughs> that was an awesome show though yeah that was I mean, great like, that was fun to, to be able to chat with a, a doctor like that who's been around the block of the psychedelics like you know with with uh what mckenna and um leary and and doblin and all those guys like it's it's a kind of a revolution happening with the, all this stuff absolutely yeah absolutely and we're glad to play a tiny role in that yeah uh so big thanks to uh Dr. Richard, for coming on the show. Uh, dude, buy his book if you can. Don't forget to send him, forward him Check my email website. of the meetup of the microdosing that you haven't read yet. You know, he talks about <laughs> microdosing, so I forward him all this information and nothing. I you think, know what, though? I, I, I should forward it to you, and then you forward it to Darren. I'm talking to James here. <laughs> and then he'll open it. I'm sure he reads your emails. Well, I don't know. He kind of ignores me, too. Does sometimes. he? Yeah. I read James's email. I read your emails sometimes. <laughs> I copy all the links you send me about vaccines. Oh, do you? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> what am I forwarding them? No, 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 no. Don't start doing that because then I'm going to start missing important emails about website servers and don't no. do that. Okay. We don't need to get James involved in. I got enough on my plate. Graham spam. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I will anyway, forward, anyways, awesome. forward that to him. Yeah. Cause, yeah uh, I got to no. send him a few things. So I'll put a little package together, send it off. Keep on me about that. Um, and we'll have him on again here in a couple months. After the Christmas break, and uh, yeah, this is probably going to come out after the Christmas break, so you know, whatever. Um, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Support yeah. the show. Yeah, support the show, guys. Check out grimerica.ca slash support. 
how that really is the only way that we're here 260 some episodes later and still chugging along and having good sound and not having to have bullshit advertisements or sponsors or commercials or paywalls or, or, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but we just prefer to just have it there. It's less work for us and it's easier for the people that can't afford the show. Cause there's all sorts of people all, all over the world that, you know, a buck a month or five bucks a month is a lot of money too. That aren't as lucky as, you know, people. I mean, there's plenty of people in, in the West that are, that it's a lot of money too as well. But, you know, so if you can sign up for a monthly, if you can't, we get it. Uh, if you can't, maybe you can check out the show notes. Graham's got a whole list of stuff you can do there that supports the show that doesn't cost you a dime. Yeah. Everything from reviewing the show to sharing the show to signing people up for the newsletter. Well, letter, we should plug even. the extra content, too, that we're still oh, yeah, putting out extra right. content. Yeah, we do. A black budget feed, right? For any donation at all, any one-time donation, any yeah. don- any uh, monthly donation. Obviously, the monthly ones help, but you get access to We got special, our first two-bucker. A personal email from Darren, and that's how you get the extra link. And it's not like we're putting out extra shows in this well, free feed pers- anyways. No, no, no. Don't say it's a personal email from Darren. I copy and paste the link. It's not like, hey, well, Thanks for subscribing. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's a copy. Well, don't you put a thank but you in there? But it happens fast. I mean, the subject line is TJ. What I mean is it's not, I think an, the it's not a bot. Like, it's not a bot email. Support. It's not a bot email. No, but it's, it's very it's robotic. Not it might seem robotic. Okay. But it's me being the robot. Okay. So you, But you actually cut and pasted it, though. So that's, that's right. putting the personal touch on it. That's can, right. you just say, can you make me a bot? Yeah. I don't know if we need two of you around, though. <laughs> <laughs> did it, did <laughs> yeah, well, on that note, guys, uh, check out grammarica.ca slash support if you can. If you can't, we don't care. Well, we do care, but not really. We're just glad you're here to listen. Make fun of Graham with us. Grambo. Graham. <laughs> He makes it so easy. He's looking good today. (laughs) He is. All right, guys. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week.
against the machine Don't get comfortable free thinkers Rage against the machine Graham, Graham. 